This is the Stop Time Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Hopkins, and I'm here to engage you in thought-provoking motivational conversations around practicing the art of living in the moment. I'm a certified life coach, and I'm excited to dig deep and offer insights into embracing who we are and where we are at. So my next guest turned down scholarships to some of the top engineering programs in the country in order to pursue the study of music at NYU. With scholarships from the Songwriters Hall of Fame and Carol Bayer Sager Foundation, he was able to pursue a degree in songwriting. And it was there where he found life-changing mentors in the late Glenn Fry and hit songwriter Phil Galston. Self released his first EP, Dragons in the Sky, had a number three hit in Australia with Summertime. He opened for the Eagles at the Beacon Theater, performed in the off-Broadway and West End hit Close to You, Burt ba- Bert Bacharach Reimagined, learned some more instruments. He plays 10 now and graduated with one, with, uh, one of America's first master's degrees in songwriting. His songwriting and performance abilities have earned multiple awards, including the prestigious Abe Ullman Scholarship from the Songwriters Hall of Fame, and he was a semi-finalist ranking in the 2020 International Songwriting Contest. Oh, and did I mention, (laughs) he served as young associate violinist to the National Symphony Orchestra while simultaneously serving as an engineer and infrared systems developer for the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory in high school. I cannot wait to get into this conversation with a multi-talented A.J. Smith. Welcome, A.J. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. Oh my gosh, it's a it's a great pleasure. I'm just uh, dying to dig in with you. Um, let's just jump in. I, I'm so intrigued by your trajectory, right? Talk to me about how you got there. Take me back. Yeah, I mean, I guess like all stories, we could start at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and that would be, you know, I, my earliest memories for the most part involve music. Um, I My godmother, who was our two doors down the street from us neighbor taught piano lessons growing up. And when I was around three, I think the story goes that I I snuck out of the house with a family dog and my mom couldn't find me, had no idea where I was. And it turns out that I had gone down the street and was pressing my ear up against the window, listening to my godmother teach piano lessons. Um, And this happened a couple of times. And finally, my parents were like, okay, we got to just put you in piano lessons with Annette. So then that way, you can you can stop running away, stop giving us heart attacks. Uh, every time we turn our backs to cook dinner or anything, um, I was disappearing out of the house. And so, yeah, that's kind of where it started. And then, you know, they took me to go see my first concert uh, at Red Rocks in Colorado, which was Yanni. Um, and then I, you know, he had a solo violinist playing with him that night. And I was like, oh, I'm just in love with the violin. Mom, can I please learn how to play the violin? You know, as a kid, you have no idea what lessons cost or anything like that, right? You're just like, I want to do it. And yeah, and then the parents kind of figure it out. And and so my mom figured it out and um, found me a, a violin teacher. And I ended up fiddling in a bluegrass band and, and all, all of these different things. And then, you know, going on to play violin as a young, young associate to the National Symphony. But I think behind all of that, I always wanted to write songs. Um not just compose. I was composing ever since I was like six or seven in my little composition notebooks. <laughs> but I, I always wanted to write songs. And the first collection of songs that I ever did, I, I think for my 10th or 11th birthday, I asked for my parents to take me to a recording studio. And I recorded really horrible, but cute, cute tunes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me just stop you there for one sec. This is so interesting. I have two questions for you already. Yeah. One one is I have this this image of you running away to hear to hear your godmother teaching. Was what was it about the music? Was there any element of I wonder what she's doing or I was it the music itself? What drew you? Yeah, I mean, I always loved the sound of the piano and I was actually just going through some home videos that my dad sent um and even I think I was maybe one and a half years old, I'm sitting at our family piano, just banging along and trying to make sounds with my hands and then turning the page of music. Uh, And I think I was just so intrigued and curious, how do you make this piano sound like 
that, what, what my godmother was playing, what her students were playing, where it actually made sense. How do you read what's on the page? Maybe I wasn't fully connecting those dots yet, but I mean, some of those dots were getting created. I was, I knew that that was music that then I'm supposed to do something with on the piano. And I, I just hadn't, and I wanted to figure that out. I wanted to know what that language was. Yeah. You know, what stands out to me is that when, as you were saying that, it sounds like like the perfect sort of intersection of, of head and heart head first. Like when I think about you as being um, having this, this uh, you know, proclivity for engineering, right. For how things work, how, you know, and it sounds like there was a big element of that first. Like, how is that happening? Not only do I love that thing that's being created, but how is it being created? Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I definitely, I mean, even still today, you know, I'll, I'll go in, I'll do some coding in order to try to figure out, Hey, what are, what are ways that I can enhance my music career or, you know, what are, what are things that I can be doing? And then when it comes to music video production and, and everything, you know, I'm very much behind the scenes and all of that too. Uh, and I, I guess that's a really great way of saying it is it's the intersection of head and heart. I think I lead a lot with the emotional that's kind of what drives me towards something. But then I, I'm just so curious that I have to unpack, you know, why, how, why do I feel this way? How do other people feel? Um, how can I describe this better? Yeah. And also it's interesting too, because I heard a distinction in composing versus songwriting, right? Mm -hmm. So you, if I heard you correctly, you learned you know, you learned the how to compose thing, but what you really wanted to do was songwrite, which again is kind of like that technical to the expression, right? Not that you, not that composing is not obviously a, a huge uh, expression, but songwriting is strikes me as, and, may, and you can tell me what it means to you. But you, you really, you, it really stood out that you said, but what I really wanted to do was songwrite, and at six it doesn't sound like it's the structure of songwriting. It was that you had something to say. T talk to me about why, what that meant to you to be a songwriter. Sure. I mean, I think they're differently accessible, you know, composing with lyrics for, uh, or songwriting and then composing without lyrics. And when I'm composing or songwriting with lyrics, I feel like I'm able to, make the emotional connection a bit more accessible where I can actually more directly speak to uh, my audience, whoever that is, and really try to use more tools in the toolbox. It's not just the musical language. It's also the lyrical spoken language. Uh, and I, so I've, I've always been really drawn to that. Uh, I, I studied film scoring at NYU and and I always loved writing instrumental music but I feel as though I was more effective in in connecting with people when I was able to to find the right lyric cuz just like music you're trying to write almost a, an emotional feeling or or express something that way in a way that's maybe not been done before um with songwriting you're you're doing that but then you're also trying to write uh, a lyric in and express something that in a way that hasn't been said before as well, which it's such a unique challenge that maybe not all songwriters think about it that way, but that's, that's how I think about it. Yeah, no, for sure. And it, connection reads loud and loud and clear, right? I mean, that makes sense. Talk to me about what connection means to you because for, for different people, it means different things. So when you're, when you're going into a place of writing a lyric, is it about, is it for you about expressing something of yourself or is it about connecting um, by sharing and, and sort of, um, as I do as a coach, like opening, you know, holding space for the opportunity to reflect on this by, I don't know, being vulnerable? Is it, is it more of a, you know, there's so many different ways you could go, right? How, how does that show up for you? I mean, for me, I, I love connecting through specific intention and so that it can be different in different circumstances and if my intention for a song is to help 
others not feel alone in an emotion and that's usually there in, in most of my writing anyways then i'll tr i'll try to make sure that it's really accessible for somebody to even if i'm being specific about my own life or my own story that there's also still an accessibility where somebody can say ah yes i you know i have that in my own life as well I think one of my one of my teachers was um, Roseanne Cash as well. I, I had the fortune of, of working with her, and she talked about how songs are like letters from the future sometimes, or that, at least that's how she feels. And mm. you know, sometimes they don't reveal to us in the moment what they mean uh, until somebody else comes back and says, "Hey, you know, I also had this." um sensation and even though it's a very specific thing that she might have written about her dad then and something that he said to her growing up um and you know nobody else had johnny cash as a father um but then you, that might be something that it speaks to somebody else in the future or it reveals its true meaning to her the writer later because maybe we're we're in touch with something in the moment of writing that maybe our subconscious has realized, but our fully awake self hasn't yet too. You know, you're speaking to also kind of the, the, the performing arts nature of it in, in where we talk about, you know, the audience being the final ingredient, right? So something new is created when it's received. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, I mean, even going to the connecting with the audience, um, I mean, that's why when arranging songs, sometimes I'll prefer to be playing a song on guitar versus piano because there's less of a physical barrier between me and the audience. And I want to be able to feel that energy coming back at me and, mm. and uh, you know, getting people to engage. And there's really no greater feeling than when you hear that your song, something that you wrote about your own life experience uh, that you put out into the world expecting nothing, that it comes back to you, um, people singing it back because they felt it was significant enough to learn the words or or mm. even somebody messaging something like, hey, you know, this got me through a really tough time or, yeah. or something like that. Yeah, no, for sure. It's, it's a crazy business, as we know. Um, and there are so many associated limiting beliefs about how you're supposed to do it, mm. right? Or you know, you know, I'm sure that that conjures all sorts of things in your head. How are you affected or not affected? Or how do, how do you navigate those things? What, what are the things that sort of scream loud in your head that you don't want to listen to things that you follow? What comes up for you? What's really challenging with the music industry is that there's almost too many facets in it, I think. And that can be extremely overwhelming because you'll have somebody saying you need to focus on TikTok or Instagram and well, SoundCloud is, is the place to blow up or, um, you know, get your Spotify streams to work or no, you should be building a Patreon page and get a smaller number, but of dedicated super fans. You should be having an email list or you should be having a text list. Um, you need to be out there playing shows. You need to be out there not just going and hitting the road and playing house shows or something. You need to be opening for people. But how do you get to open for people? Uh, well, you need to be on a label. Well, the major labels are only interested if you're on TikTok. Like all of this. And there's there's so many different avenues and approaches and, um, and different things that you need to be focusing on all at once that it can be at times really difficult to focus well on any one individual thing. Uh, because then within all of that, you're also supposed to be writing and creating great vulnerable uh, <laughs> material that is going to be unique and different from anything that anybody else is doing. And there's 50,000 songs released on Spotify a day. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how do you cut through? Um, and so I think the, the, the noise is one thing that's really difficult to, to listen to. Um, and then the other is when people who will come in and say, ah, you know, the, the thing that you're not doing is X or the thing that you're not doing is Y because you want to believe so badly 
that the only thing standing between you and whatever your benchmark of success is, is this magic elixir solution that somebody else has brought to the table. And it can be really damaging to self-confidence and faith in oneself when you listen to that. Um, yeah. But it's hard not to listen to that because it's such a complex multifaceted industry. Yeah, no, 100%. And it's interesting though, because you are so multifaceted yourself, it's true. I mean, I think that's an absolute true statement <laughs> that, you know, there's just, there's just so much going on. Right. And, and it, you know, we all wish we, we knew the secret elixir or whatever. Um, but you with the sort of natural propensity to be able to do that. Do you come down on yourself by saying I should be able to do this? Like, do you, do you have higher expectations on yourself? Absolutely. And I think that one of the things that I've struggled with is I know that I have a lot of capabilities in a lot of different areas, which is great. Uh, but then it also means that, you know, I think sometimes success can come through specialization and because I am able to do a lot in different areas. I'm really techie. And so I, I update my website and I, I now am in control of that, even though I have a management team, because I, I at least believe that you can always do the best job yourself. Sometimes that can end up being a trap where just because I'm capable doesn't mean that I need to be responsible for it. Um, because otherwise now I'm distracted by having too many tasks on my plate. Mm -hmm. And I'm unable to focus at the end of the day on maybe the two or three most important things that I need to be doing. And it's, it's hard too, because then I'm not sure what those two or three things are at times um, because there's all of that noise. Um, and so I think that can kind of hold me back at times. It's so interesting because we're talking about tools, right? And what, what, what comes to me and what I would, what I would encourage you to remember is there is one thing that you are the top expert in and always will be, and that's you. Mm. And you are the brand. So how, how you are presented to other people, I mean, obviously when you show up physically, but in terms of your music, in terms of what you give the people to promote or what you put out there, I mean, nobody can do what you can do. Yeah, that, that's actually really interesting too, because, you know, I, I recently, I wanted to bring my brand, make it more cohesive as an artist. And so I, I started working with the stylist and I had some other people in order because I know that, hey, I know what I like fashion wise and all of that. But, you know, to a certain extent, that is part of the look as is everything, you know, and I, I, I direct or produce all of my own music videos. And I'm very good at putting together looks for that. But when it comes to every day or, you know, anything that if I need to go and perform on a, on a TV show or something like that, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure what to wear. Uh, and so I had one person saying, well, we need to give you more edge. We need to make you more of a bad boy. And I'm like, well, that's not really, my writing style isn't like that. Um, none of the end. I was, I was listening to that a little bit because there's that voice in the back of the head saying, ah, maybe this is the elixir, that one magic trick that's going to unlock the door that I haven't been able to unlock yet. Um, but then I ended up, I, I felt so uncomfortable that I was like, no, this isn't me. This isn't authentic to who I am. Yeah. And so I ended up, you know, having, having to do a little bit more research and, and finding out, okay, well, what does line up more with who I am? And I, I found a great stylist and, and worked with them to to put together my looks for my tour and put together my looks for my future videos and everything like that and I, now i'm actually very happy with it but i was almost diverted off course yeah just by that certainty totally you know so often because we're so capable <laughs> hmm. um you know we get caught in the weeds right Absolutely. and and leadership there's a wonderful metaphor for leadership, which is that, you know, you can get caught down in the management in the weeds, right? Or you can climb up the tree, climb higher to the tree. So you have a meta view and look down and go, we're in the wrong jungle. We're in the wrong forest. That's the leader, right? That's, that's you. Only you can see that, but not if you're stuck down in the weeds, right? 
Yeah. That's great. I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I let myself get stuck in the weeds sometimes. And yeah. You know. And it's normal. We do because we want to listen and, and we're excited. And sometimes because we feel capable, you know, we get jazz. We go, yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds great. That sounds great. And, and, you know, it, as cliche as it sounds, the finding our why, remembering our why, that's home base. Why am I doing this? Like, actually, let me ask you this, let, you know, so I don't know, next year, uh, we get on the phone call together and you go, Lisa, <laughs> since we talked, this is what's going on. My life has changed completely since that conversation we had. What would you be telling me? I mean, I would hope that I would be telling you that I have now made music is my in entire source of income that I, I mean, obviously during COVID, I picked up other things. I kind of relied back on my, my technical skills and coding, mm -hmm. doing freelance and everything like that. But I would love for music to be my sole source of income and sustain sustaining myself. Um, I would love to be able to say that I finally got my entire album out um, and that, uh, yeah, sure. I, I would think of maybe some metrics like, oh, and it got listened to by millions of people or something like that. I mean, that would be great. But I mean, for me, I think I, I benchmark my success more in I, I actually just want to put my body of work out into the world and whatever mm. happens to it happens to it. But I think that there's so much fear of releasing material because it won't be accepted, you know, and then I've, and I've done that before and I have so many songs that are really great songs, but maybe aren't competitive with the things that I'm writing now or don't fit. You said great. You said, you know, they're great, but, and I get that, right. I'm sure that, you know, that's not right. We hear that all the time. It's not right. It's not, you know, that's not the right time for the, whatever. What, what, talk to me about how, you know, in your body that it's great, despite what anyone says. Because it, these songs evoke very strong emotional reactions, um, from myself first and foremost, I guess, you know, if, if it doesn't work on me, then it's not going to work on anybody. Um, but then once I've played those songs out live, I, I know the reactions that it, they get from other people. I guess the reason that I then say, but mm -hmm. it's because I know that I've grown as a writer since then. Uh, and I know that my, I've grown as a singer and as a, producer and so i would have to rethink how i would produce these songs to have them fit with my sound now mm -hmm. uh, i think but hey maybe that's a limiting belief maybe these songs could still get put out under a different project or maybe they don't need to be part of my album they can just live on their own mm. It's interesting i'm hearing two things one is and i want to I, i'd love to talk to you about how I don't know if perfectionism is the right word, but what I'm hearing you say is, you know, they're, they're great. And they, they were very evocative, which is that heart center. Right. <laughs> but then the head comes in and goes, yeah, but I'm so much better technically in this. And I'm, you know, much more, you know, so, so you're, you're rating what you want, what you, what you feel is great. <laughs> and then you kind of say, but yeah, but the world is telling me no, but actually you're telling yourself no. So I'm just going to point that out. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, I, it's, it's absolutely true. And, I, I think some of that ties into, you know, yeah, because we grow, because we get better. And then it's, you look back on the things that you used to do. You know, I look back at the songs that I wrote when I was 10 and I think, oh, they're adorable, but they're horrible. Um, and sometimes I look back on even songs that I've released within the last few years and I go, uh, that was cute. <laughs> you know, um, But, you know, I've, I've grown since then. Um, but Hey, maybe if somebody else would get something out of it, there's, there's no reason that it can't be out in the world. Well, it's really funny because I feel, I really believe that we always do the best we can at any given moment, right? Nobody plays to fail. So when you wrote those songs, you were full on. I mean, that's, you strike me as someone that is very intentional and, and you were writing them for real reasons at the time. And although you now may not relate in the same way, would it be fair to say that they still are, you know, authentic and actually speak to who you were then? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
And if, you know, of course you've grown, everybody grows, right? But, you know, it's, it's a part of you, right? And I understand, I mean, obviously, if there are certain things that, that you were doing during your trajectory that, you know, that were cute and were part of a stepping stone towards something else, cool, right? Um, but if, if, there are, if there are things out there that, that you feel, you know, really speak to a part of who you are, I encourage you to, to remember that you're right. I mean, you don't know how that might touch other people in a different stage of their growth. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I I, had, I actually have played around with the idea of when I'm done with this album or maybe in between releasing singles for it to just drop maybe the four, three or four most, I think, effective or transformative songs that never got to be put out into the world because I was too afraid to put them out then um, and to put them out now and say, hey, you know, this isn't part of this album, but these songs were really important to my growth as a writer and artist. And I hope that you, you like them. Mm. What a gift that would be, right? I think so. I mean, it it would be myself to a certain extent to just say, Hey, you know what? These songs are out and you did it. Yeah. Yeah. What's your Achilles heel? Would you say? Perfectionism. Okay. 110%. So I was hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you hit it right on the nail, right on the head. <laughs> so where does that come from? Hmm. Well, you could say because of the classical music upbringing, possibly. You know, of uh, needing to practice a part a hundred times until you had it perfect, or you know, a thousand times, or however many times it took. I. <sighs> I think it's that maybe the head piece coming in the you know, leading with the heart, but then the head saying, can I communicate this in a better way? Can I sing this better than I did? Can I play this more effectively? You know, I, I constantly think, well, that was great, but I could do better. And I think it's a double-edged sword because on one hand, it's pushed me to grow mm-hmm. a lot. Uh, and I think that that's a healthy dose of that helps push anybody. But then it can also create a fear of rejection, I guess, because you're thinking that it's not good enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you never think that it's good enough, because you always think that you can do better, then, I mean, what good are all the songs doing on my hard drive? Yeah, no, absolutely. Fear is such an interesting thing. And, and this perfectionism thing too, because you're right. You know, it's a very fine line of, you know, can, when you were talking about, can, can I make this better and all that, if it's done in an energetic way where you're looking at possibilities and it energizes you. So it's coming from choice rather than force, which is no, no, no you can do better than this do better, <laughs> right? This isn't good enough. These are all those sort of negative messages, right? Or it could be, wow, that's cool. I wonder if dot, 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 kind of like when you ran out of the house and were like, ooh, what's she playing? What is that? I, you know, or when you saw the violin and those things, like you, you weren't like, I want to be perfect at that. You were like, I want to do that, right? Yeah. And then, and then fear is also truly a, a mask for desire. So fear is a really a good thing. Because often it shows up and you're like, oh, that scares me. Maybe it's because I want to do it. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a great point. Well, I, and you know, that's sort of the, the idea of, you know, like what, what I was imagining was, um, you know, the, what's the Robert Frost poem? Mm. Uh, the, uh, the path not taken or. or, or yeah, you know, I know which one you're speaking of. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of thinking through, Hey, am I excited to go down a different path? Am I afraid of this path, but am I afraid of it because I, I want to go down it or mm-hmm. it's just that it's the wrong path. And I think oftentimes when you have that, um, you know, like I was afraid of being turned into something that I'm not. And I think that was a good fear because well, I don't want to be somebody that I'm not. But then at the same time, 
have I been afraid to be my most authentic self and to put out those raw, heavy with mistakes kind of recordings um, when at the end of the day, we're all human and we all make mistakes. And, you know, there's, and now I think there's been a, this movement of authenticity, which I think is really powerful, but then also disarming in some ways uh, for the perfectionists, because like me, because I'm like, wait, no, I, I don't want you to see me without my makeup on metaphorically. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't want you to hear me unrehearsed. But then, you know, I have to think, well, I've been rehearsing for my entire life. So, <laughs> you, yeah. know. you know, it's kind of a cautionary tale when we tie in those sort of uh, limiting beliefs and all these messages of the industry, the external noise that you're referring to, mm. especially now that the trend needs to be authentic. Like, God forbid now that comes into your, you know, yours or anyone else's brain of like, I'm doing it because this is what I'm supposed to be doing, which is yeah. actually inauthentic. <laughs> Uh, and I, I feel that 110%. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And we're, you know, we come by it honestly, because we're hardwired to protect ourselves. Yeah, so sure. if, we're, if we're strong willed, then, you know, it, sometimes it takes a really loud voice, especially the closer you get to doing something that's scary, the louder the voice will come going, no, don't do it. You're going to be in it. Yo, it's bad. It's going to be bad. Um, okay. So I'm going to ask you to put humility aside for a moment and ask you to tell me, what would you say are your unique gifts? Creativity, I think is very unique. It's something that I can tap into um, pretty well. Uh, I like to study and I can, I can pick up quickly on, on things. I have a tendency to learn quickly when I'm passionate about something, mm. which I think is, is something that, I mean, I think probably all of us are blessed with, but, um, you know, when there's passion, then you can learn about anything quickly, but it's something that I, I'm very grateful for. Um, and then I think just how, how empathetic and caring and loving I am as a human being. Um, you know, I think that that's something that I mean, it's, it's led me to my, my relationship with Rihanna. Um, and it's made that better. It's made my relationship with my family better. It's made my, I think my writing better. Um, it's made my ability to put on somebody else's shoes and, and understand why they are hurt and be able to write about that experience. It can be a painful thing to, to, to really absorb somebody else's emotions and lived experiences. Uh, but I think it can also be a necessary thing. Mm. And, and I think that's, those are kind of my three top gifts. I would, I would probably say. Yeah. So empathy, right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Is that something that you, that you've developed those, those gifts, or is it something that sort of you felt were already there? How did they, sort of manifest in you as you got older. How old are you? 31. 31, yeah. So I'm just curious to know, like, has anything changed? Or at, what's, what's been the trajectory of that, of those gifts for you, those inner gifts? Mm, that's interesting to think about. Well, I think a lot of us are creative when we're young. I think we're constantly, you know, like what, I was just seeing uh, my fiance's nephew and he was saying that he was going to build me a red house and I would be wearing blue and he would call it the purple house, mm. which is, I once built a Lego house for my mom out of red and blue Legos. And she goes, Oh, what's this? And I said, it's my purple house. So it was kind of really wild to me hearing him parrot that back. And, and I'm thinking, gosh, that's that's the kind of creativity that, you know, sometimes I think that a lot of us are born with, but then life will often make us shut off potential choices because specialization can breed success or whatever that is. And and so then when you tune out 
so much noise and so many opportunities, then eventually you're left only following a limited number of beliefs and limited number of paths. Um, and so I think that it's something that maybe we're all born with, but that then you have to choose to, um, to caretake, to, you know, to tend to. Um, and I think that's the same with empathy. I think, you know, babies, they, they laugh when you laugh, they cry when you cry. I, I think that we're very empathetic creatures, but, you know, out of fear, um, we learn to turn that off because we don't, we can't go through our day feeling what everybody else around us feels all the time. We have to be able to make difficult decisions. Sometimes we have to be able to make um, exciting decisions despite fears, you know, and, and so we learn to turn that off too. But I think that we can shut it off. And then I think this is sort of what happened to me. Then I ended up, uh, you know, and by the time I was in high school, I was maybe less empathetic because, and maybe that's a biology thing. Um, and then when I moved to New York, I became more empathetic. I think just based off of the the company that I was keeping, I, I found all of these great friends, and um, and I, I grew into an adult during those formative years. Um, really caring so much about all of these different experiences other than my own. And maybe because in my high school, most of us were, Hey, we were all nerdy tech kids who were kind of going after the same things, trying to get good grades, trying to do all of this. And, and so then, you know, you're the things that you care about are narrowed. Um, and then in New York, this big melting pot of lived experiences and people and everything, you know, the things that you care about can widen. Um, and then I guess when it comes to, you know, the ability to learn quickly or pick up on things that I'm passionate about quickly, I guess that kind of just, that ties back into having those inner voices that tell you that you can't do something or the inner voices that tell you that you can. Mm. Um, and I think I've always had a, an inner voice that tells me that I, and maybe it comes from my mom or, you know, my dad saying, oh, you can be anything you want to be or, you know, whatever. But, you know, I, I really believe that I could, if I devoted the time, if I devoted myself, that I could learn how to do anything if I were passionate enough about it. I believe that any of us can. And I think because of that core belief, I've been able to learn how to code infrared sensors for the for the navy and build apps and also compose music and learn 10 different instruments and <laughs> yeah no for sure it's interesting you mentioned uh your time in new york that would have been the time i'm guessing where you had a pretty big decision to make about whether you were gonna follow that engineering scholarship or pursue music right so what came up for you then? How did, what played into that, that decision? I was sitting on stage, I believe at either the Kennedy Center or one of the other music halls in the DC area. And we were playing the orchestral suites to West Side Story, which is really funny because my fiance, Brianna, is in the West Side Story movie. And we get to the end of the piece and it's just so beautiful. And I almost started crying. I actually think I did just start crying on stage because I had been putting so much pressure on myself to make the right decision. And then the right decision revealed itself to me. I couldn't give up the ability to write, to learn how to write and evoke that kind of emotional response from others um, that I had, for whatever reason, the proclivity to tap into the musical ether of the universe and to not do that would be i would regret it a lot and so the decision was kind of made for me yeah wow that's beautiful i i can picture it. it's visceral right yeah mm. wow and how much sooner did you were you living in new york at that time or where were you where were you I was I was at home. I was where my parents lived in the D.C. area. I, I went to a 
my high school was called Thomas Jefferson High School for science <laughs> and technology. So, you know, it's um, yeah. a science and tech school. But then yeah. I did the drama program and music and orchestra. And uh, I, I'm probably one of the very few alumni from my high school that didn't just go off and work at like Google or something. And I, you know. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Hmm. Hopefully, you know what? I'm going to stop saying hopefully. I'm just going to say where I see myself. Perfect. Walking off stage, performing to a great community of people who are all singing my songs and have felt connected to each other and to um, the universe and to me through my music uh, into the arms of my then wife and driving across the country together, seeing the entire world together and connecting with communities all over the world. Um, but then coming home to a place that we've built for ourselves that feels safe and makes us feel happy. Yeah. That was beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with me. How do you, how do you want to be remembered? Ooh. That's the deep questions here on this podcast. Um, <laughs> fondly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess I would like to be remembered fondly, uh, but also I believe is somebody who it, who made an impact greater than themselves yet i say this as not somebody who's out there like i just did a an interview with food for life global who feeds you know people who need it a million meals a day mm. you know i'm not out here doing that for the world but hopefully my music can end up i'm using the gifts that i have to to maybe touch that many people's lives or maybe it's just one singular person that finds hope in my music and they go off and and do something fantastic with their life to make something better for the next generation um i just i want to inspire people i want i want them to feel inspired to chase their dreams um because you know i think there's so many reasons that we tell ourselves and so many reasons that we find in order to not go after what we really want to do. And if I can be a reason for somebody to go and do what they really do want to do, I think that's that's how it, I, I would want to be remembered. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, can you finish this phrase? Most people think AJ Smith is, but the truth is. <laughs> uh, tall. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. People always, I, I, I know that's a bit of a joke of an answer, but <laughs> for whatever reason, whenever I meet people for the first time in person, they always go, oh, I thought you were taller. I'm like, why? why? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, either that or I, I feel like a lot of people look to me, at least even sometimes in friend groups, you know, that, that, I'm, that I've got it all together and that I'm maybe because of that perfectionism that I have, I, I only let the world see the perfect version of myself sometimes. Um, but I'm not, I'm, I'm a human just like everybody else. I make mistakes. I, um, I, I take steps off, off my path in this noisy path of road or whatever world of the music industry and, and life. And all I can do is just try to, to find my footing and get back on the road to where I'm supposed to go, just like anybody else. So hopefully nobody else is holding themselves back because they look at me and think, Oh, well, he's got it all together. And I don't because eh, I do not. <laughs> I, I'm no better than, the, than anybody else. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. Love it. All right. So we're going to play what makes you. Okay. So I'm going to say what makes you, I'll say a word and then you just say what comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Sound good. Sounds great. Okay. What makes you hungry? Chipotle. <laughs> what makes you sad? Heartbreak. 
What inspires you? Mm, love. What frustrates you? Myself. <laughs> what makes you laugh? My dog. What makes you angry? Mm, failure. <laughs> yeah. And finally, what makes you grateful? Brianna was the first person that came to mind. I was trying to think of something less specific in my own life, though. Um, opportunity. Mm. Beautiful. What are the top three things that have happened so far today? Well, being on this podcast, of course, is number one. Uh, number two, dancing in the kitchen before this podcast with Brianna um, after she got home. Just, just sometimes the little things in the day. Just I go to give her a hug and just kind of slow waltzed for, for a minute. Um, <laughs> and then I got the official social media assets for my performance on the Kelly Clarkson show, um, which is, I'm not sure when this is going to air, but it's April 5th is when I perform on the Kelly Clarkson show. Oh, cool. That'll be fun. <laughs> do you know what you're doing? Like, do you have a, how does the perfectionist come into your brain right now with that? Are you like getting all ready or what's? Well, uh, <laughs> so behind the scenes scoop, I I've already done it. <laughs> so, uh, okay. I pre-recorded the video already. So, Perfect. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. Was it, what came up for you preparing for that? Anything? Was that it? Or was that just not, I mean, I know you do a lot of stuff, so was it not a big deal for you? Um, well, you know, I think when we recorded the video, we, we didn't know whether or not they were going to actually air it or pick it because, you know, I think most of these slots are used by major label artists and I'm an independent and we were preparing a video for them. Um, in case they had somebody drop out or mm. just in case they liked the performance enough that they would flex it in and air it. Got and it. Um, so in one way that was super, it made me feel like I was auditioning and I had to be perfect. But then in another, I also felt as though, Hey, you know what, whatever's going to happen happens. I've helped Brianna with enough self tapes to realize that sometimes it's, it's not about how good of a job you do. It's about what, how they how somebody else sees that role being filled and maybe i fit that and maybe i don't and maybe that's okay um and so in one ways i was putting a lot of pressure on myself but then another i was taking it off and, and so i kind of just i i just did the best that i could do on that day yeah. and uh well it, <laughs> here it is it's happening it's it's uh yeah I there you that. go yeah. So remind, I encourage you to remember that, that, that attitude, that mindset seems to work well for you there. <laughs> what are you most looking forward to today or just to, or, or in life, whatever comes to mind? Um, getting married and mm. in my album, I think are the, the two things. Yeah. Fair enough. AJ, it's been such a joy speaking with you today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's been awesome. I have been speaking today with AJ Smith. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. And remember to live in the moment. In music, stop time is that beautiful moment where the band is suspended in rhythmic unison, supporting the soloist to express their individuality. In the moment, I encourage you to take that time and create your own rhythm. Until next time, I'm Lisa Hopkins. Thanks for listening.